Okay, hi everyone. So this is lecture number two, week number two for CAN 3, 430, sorry, process design one. Um, in this lecture, we'll talk about steps in process design and process creation. There should be another video as well talking about um, the first tutorial in Aspen Plus, but this will be a separate video. <clears throat> okay, so just a bunch of quick announcements. Homework one will be assigned today. It will be due on September 14th. This homework is a group submission, so please work in your project groups. Um, if you don't know what, where, which group you're in, the groups are posted on Blackboard. This will be the group you're gonna work with throughout the semester um, on your project, on your homework. So get to know each other, develop some synergies, and you know, develop an understanding. The last day to make any group changes is August 31st by midnight, so it's Monday. And the last day to give me your project selections will be September 14th by midnight. So the list of projects available for you this semester has been posted on Blackboard. Go over there, have a look, and please send me your project selection by September 14th. If you don't send me your project selection, I'll assign you to a random project um, based on how, just based on what's available, okay? So let's, uh, let's get started by talking about steps and process design. So um, design, process design is motivated by a design problem, primitive design problems where basically either you're designing a chemical plant from scratch or you're retrofitting an existing chemical plant and you're always motivated by a desire to make profitable chemicals that meet some societal or you know, some uh, industrial need. And as a chemical engineer, you can work in many areas, you know, petrochemicals, polymers, coatings, pharmaceuticals, you have unlimited sort of, um, or let's say you're very versatile to work in any industry you want. And as long as you remember your fundamentals from a process design perspective, as well as from a, you know, continuity equation, mass balance, um, thermodynamic perspective, you should be able to easily move from one area to the other, all right? Um, and uh, recently, you know, due to growing awareness, there's a lot of retrofitting activities happening for old plants and legacy plants, most commonly, for example, power plants. If you've read the news or something, there's a lot of coal power plants being retrofitted, you know, being decommissioned to meet new um, environmental regulations and that sort of thing. So, you know, depending where you work, just you need to understand that different approaches to design or different objectives of design will have different steps. Um, so the origin of design problems usually start from, they could start from a bunch of different sources, but typically you could have some exploration of chemists, biochemists and engineers in a research lab. So you have someone in a research lab, whether it's a national lab, a university, an industrial lab, he finds out a new synthesis route for a chemical which is in demand. Um, so he passes it on to the engineering team and they start brainstorming. What's the best way to make tons of this product? Or what's the best way to you know, generate this product for the market? Um, you know, historically, there are some products like Teflon were discovered by accident. You know, there's a lot of, uh, lot of these stories. A lot of them are very interesting, but generally the flow is the same. A chemist finds a, or a chemical engineer working in a lab finds a basic reaction. He ships it off to the engineers working on the design and they start doing their feasibility analysis. In other cases, an expensive source of a raw material becomes available. So for example, uh, a country discovers a huge basin of natural gas or a country discovers a huge uh, resource of lithium for them to make batteries. They have this huge resource raw materials. And there's a big demand for it. Um, there's a huge market for it. So what they start developing processes. And now we start looking at the specifics of this natural gas or this lithium or this oil. You know, it's not all the same. You know, sometimes uh, you dig, you find oil that's very rich in sulfur, sometimes has no sulfur, very viscous, not viscous. So you start building your plant around that type of thing. Um, and the final source is the engineer himself. So uh, as many of these processes are motivated by engineers, they look, uh, they find that the existing process is not very 
feasible or has a lot of weaknesses. So, so they start thinking about it using their engineering judgment, engineering science to try and build a new process, which is more efficient, makes more profit, et cetera. All right, so um, most of the time, or in most um, companies, industrial companies, they follow some sort of project management or um, design structure. So if you do some, or if you get exposed to like PMP courses or Six Sigma or whatever, a lot of them try to follow a very structured um, approach. And this makes it easy for technology transfer between companies, makes it easier for companies to exchange expertise and that type of thing. However, they generally go through fixed stages. The first one is the initial decision. So um, you have a design team which uh, has a, an idea. So they start developing a project charter or first thing they think, um, so we have a material or whatever, is it patentable? Has it been done before? What What is the existing literature? What's the existing state of the art? They wanna make some changes. They do some materials development. And then if there's no changes, they can look at the process manufacturing. Has it been done before? Do we need to start thinking about new approaches? They work with the process technology team to try and find the solutions. And then they reach this called um, the initial gate stage for process development. Okay. And once you're at this point, it means you have a basic idea that, or a basic uh, seed for the uh, initiation of a project company-wide, you start engaging more departments and that type of thing. Then you move to the concept and feasibility. So I have an idea. So let's look at uh, the concept. Let's start having a quick look at the market, having a quick look at the synthesis routes, maybe do some bench scale, laboratory, more experiments, that type of thing. Try to better understand the thermodynamics, the kinetics, all of this stuff. Once we're happy with this, we move to the feasibility stage or you know, once it makes sense, uh, very common or a very recently um, uh, famous chemical or a group of chemicals which failed at the concept stage was ionic liquids. A lot of people are still pursuing it, but generally now a lot of people are giving up on it because you know at a very small scale it makes sense. The chemistry is very nice, but when you look at the concept stage thermodynamically, they're not stable, extremely viscous, that type of thing. So it would fail at this stage, and you wouldn't really start thinking about the feasibility. However, if you end up moving to the feasibility, now is where you develop the base case design. And at the end of this course, um, you should have some sort of um, sense of developing a base case design of any chemical. So at the end of this course, if you can reach to this stage, that would be very good. Um, if you can move further, have at least a sense or an idea of moving further, that would be excellent. Um, and you, if you do some internships or whatever, you could probably have a sort of vision of how these things go. But at the feasibility stage, you basically build your base case. You maybe build it in Aspen. You do your basic mass balance, heat balance. You do some uh, uh, optimization activities like heat transfer networks, mass transfer networks, all of this stuff. And you provide an overall assessment of the process and of the, this plant which uh, might be built. Once you're happy with this, you take it to development and manufacturing. And now, we, now we're talking about the details. Um, are, are there suppliers that can make the reactor I want? Are there, um, what's the best packing I can use for my distillation columns? Um, safety analysis, do I need relief valves, PNID diagrams? Now my base case sketch, I start adding instrumentation, adding this and that, really looking into extreme details. And then I start manufacturing where I start engaging suppliers, subcontractors to try, let's come build this plant, um, start thinking about things like startup, operation, what's the best practice, all of this stuff. And finally, your product introduction, which is, uh, so you start your plant, you have a product, you do the marketing, you do the pricing, you do what, this and that, to try and make money out of your product. So uh, as a chemical engineer, you could end up working in any of these stages. Initial decision stage, usually will involve like, if you work in R&D or that type of thing, you would be more at the top. Concept and feasibility this is very typical. Uh, maybe project engineer or, you know, maybe a, a research engineer as well. Development manufacturing, this is where you have a process engineers, um, you know, technology uh, specialists, that type of thing. They start developing the process. And then finally, product introduction. So um, a lot of chemical engineers end up working in advertising, marketing, technical sales, 
this is where this is at the stage where you'll be operating where you need to have an understanding of what's going on you need to have a technical understanding of of the process of what the product does but your main objective is to sell it to customers or sell it to um you know uh, mid-scale suppliers who might not really be interested in technical skills but would like to know them. okay moving on so these are the basic steps in process design or you know if we were trying to think about it in an algorithmic way. Initially, you start off by assessing the primitive, uh, assessing the primitive problem, right? Having a look at uh, why do I need to develop a pro process? What's what's the need here? Is it because I found a new chemistry which is feasible? Is there a glaring demand? Is there is the current process unsafe or you know not reliable or has a lot of shutdowns? So I have a primitive problem which I need to solve. Then I develop a base case. A base case is like a, um, a very large, um, high-level design of the proposed plant. So let's say I want to find a feasible reaction, produce the chemical I want. So I say, okay, so this looks like it. I'll need a reactor here, a couple of separators to do this and that. And okay, the stoichiometry makes sense. This is my base case. Maybe I had a few pumps here. Okay, major pumps, whatever it is. And you have a base case sketch of your process. Um, once you're done with your base case, you start looking at um, detailed process synthesis or algorithmic methods. And this will involve now, let's look at the temperatures, pressures of all the streams, see am I violating any thermodynamics? Um, do I have chemicals which are up, which exist you know, beyond their critical point or whatever it is? And if so, what 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 can I do? What optimization activities can I do to try and avoid this or bridge this? And this is really your detailed processes. We'll get to this towards the end of the semester. And this is really where you do a lot of your numerical um, or you know problem solving in the scores. Developing heat exchange networks will be a big part of this course, and we'll get to it later. Um, afterwards, you do a plant-wide controllability assessment, and this we won't really cover in this course, but um, after do, doing your detailed process senses, you need to take a good look and see is, is this process can i control this process using current technology or you know do, do i expect this reactor to run at uh, uh residence time of half a second is this feasible can i control this startup um you know am, am i jumping from 50 celsius to 2000 celsius too quickly um you need to start looking at controllability assessment and this will also involve some sort of safety assessment um you know safety instrument and systems safety control and that type of thing and uh, obviously there's some iterative process between all of these steps so at the detailed pro uh, synthesis or algorithmic stage find out something doesn't make sense maybe you develop change your base case you go back and forth similarly um you can go back and forth uh with your controls so if, if you have a piece of uh you look at your control system and you find out there's this area that looks very complex that will be prone to errors prone to you know controller drifting whatever it is maybe is there a way i can change it from a design um element from a basic design element can i change this process somehow process flow diagram somehow to avoid these issues and then finally once you're happy with all of this you move it to the detailed design and this will involve your equipment sizing your cost estimation profitability analysis and optimization in this course we'll uh, cover equipment sizing cost estimation um, profitability analysis and optimization we might touch on them briefly but um, um, you should be able to at least know okay how big is this reactor how big is this installation column which i'm going to use um, does this cost estimate make sense you know after making a plant costs um, five billion dollars is this competitive with the market or is this just a complete outlier you know you need to be able to use these sort of um, assessments when making your overall process design decisions Okay, so per, part one, always at the beginning of, uh, um, of designing, you look at the assess primitive problems and developing your base case. And this is what we're gonna talk about right now. <clears throat> so your process design begins with a primitive design problem, as we said, that expresses a current situation and provides an opportunity to satisfy a societal need. So you don't want to make a product which no one wants to buy. Because as a chemical engineer, at the end of the day, or engineers, um, it's a business which makes money, right? So you need to make something where you have an opportunity, where there's a need for it. 
um, or someone is interested in it, okay? Generally, primitive problem is examined by a small design team. You assess the possibility, you refine the problem statement. So is your problem statement, I just, uh, let's find a better way to make ammonia. It's a very general problem statement. Maybe a better one will be, you know, there's this huge resource of natural gas. Uh, it, uh, we, we, we get it at a very high pressure. What's the best way to make ammonia out of it to meet, you know, the demand in this country of 10 million, uh, whatever a day, right? So you try to refine your problem, try to zone in so that you're not just um, designing for the sake of design and wasting money and resources. And the, once you refine your problem, you start generating more specific problems. So once you have an understanding, you start looking at typical specific problems such as raw materials. Um, can I make these raw materials? Do I have to buy them? If I have to buy them, are there suppliers in the area or do I have to buy them from uh, Germany or China or whatever? Um, does it make sense to buy them? And these sort of gateway problems will, 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 will give you a general idea of, of how well you're doing. The scale of this process. Um, this plant, is it gonna be a huge plant where I need maybe three reactors or is it like a manageable plant where there are many which have been built world, worldwide, right? Um, and understanding the scale of the process will guide a lot of your design decisions because um, there, there are units which scale linearly, there are units which don't scale li linearly, and there are units um, which you basically have to split them into trains, right? So um, most commonly a reactor or most commonly a natural gas processing plant. Um, if I double my capacity, do I just double the volume or do I run two trains in parallel or two reactors in parallel? And these decisions, we're gonna cover them in kinetics as well, um, whether you get a bigger reactor, divide two reactors in parallel, but you can do basic economics for this. And then finally, location of, for the plant. Do I have a location for it or um, will I end up having to transfer all of this raw material across the country and it doesn't make sense, right? So we need to look at all these things. And then once you have your specific problems, you need to brainstorm, you know? Um, or can we find a feasible solution? Um, just using off the paper, like, you know, back of the hand calculations, are these solutions feasible for this or are they not? And once you, and that this is the point where you either have a project being born or you just give up and forget about it. it's gonna be a waste of time, right? Okay, so let's look at an example or a typical example. Um, VCM, which is vinyl chloride polymer, monomer, sorry. And uh, VCM vinyl chloride is, is the monomer used to make PVC. PVC is uh, one of the most commonly produced uh, plastics. They make pipes, they make all sorts of things out of PVC. Um, I'm sure you've heard about PVC piping before, all of this stuff. Okay. So the problem or the primitive problem statement, the prim primitive need here is to satisfy the need for an additional 800 million pounds per year of vinyl chloride monomer, the following plausible alternatives might be generated. So you have a need for 800 million pounds a year for vinyl chloride polymers, and you have a bunch of alternatives. Um, so alternative one, competitor's plant produces 2 million barrels per year, barrels, sorry, 2 million pounds per year of uh, vinyl chloride monomers located about 100 miles away. Maybe we can expand this to make the amount needed and then ship it. Um, in this case, the design team projects the purchase price and design storage facilities, right? So you have a need, first alternative. Let's look at the competitive plant, uh, competitor's plant, sir. We're gonna buy it, we're gonna expand it. And all we have to do in this case is just uh, look at our breakpoints and design some facilities to store all of this VCM. Alternative two, we buy this VCM and buy pipeline from a nearby plant. Um, sorry, or alternative two would be, so we purchase by pipeline from a nearby plant, we buy the chlorine, which is made by electrolysis of NaCl, and then we act the chlorine with ethylene to produce um, VCM and HCl, all right? This is the second alternative. So there's a plant nearby which makes uh, chlorine. We're just gonna buy their chlorine and then we're gonna bring it on site as a raw material, react with ethylene, which is a raw material we already have to make this product and HCl. And alternative three, company produces HCl as a byproduct in large quantities. 
So HCl is already available. So we have a raw material which is available at a low price. So let's react HCl with, with acetylene or ethylene and oxygen to produce an intermediate, which is 1,2-dichloroethane. And then we crack this intermediate to make minyl chloride. So this is my third alternative. So again, when looking at this, so if you go back um, to the slide before, this is your primitive problem. This is your primitive problem right here. So I have a need for additional 800 million pounds per year, vinyl chloride polymer. You look at your alternatives or your, your, your different, uh, so this is where we're basically assessing the primitive problem, looking at the, um, uh, examining the pr problem, looking at the possibilities and refining the problem statements to find better solutions, right? And we have three alternatives. And now we're gonna brainstorm these alternatives, trying to see if, if any of these make sense. Maybe this, we can uh, do a quick calculation to see does it make sense to ship it. For this one, we look and look at the technology. Is it safe? Um, is it worth buying this plant or just buying from them? And for this one, I see acetylene here, very flammable explosive chemical. Is it worth uh, using this large amount of acetylene to produce this large amount of vinyl chloride? Okay. <clears throat> okay, this seems to be the same slide, but uh, no, that's the basic idea. Okay, moving on. So the first step would be survey literature sources, right? So now we, we have three alternatives. We want to make a, a decision. We want to have a look at the best approach. So we really need to have an understanding. So before building the base case or before moving forward, we need to have an understanding of the different chemistries, different routes, whatever it is. So usually do survey your literature sources. You have encyclopedias as a process engineer or as an engineer on this, on the, um, and on a plant, you typically don't look at journal papers or scientific papers because these tend to be very specific. Um, and you look more at uh, encyclopedias. Very common ones are Kirk Othmer Encyclopedia, Ullman's, uh, Ullman's Encyclopedia, Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook, CRC Handbook. These are very um, useful resources for you and they usually summarize a lot of these processes. Um, patents, very useful, internet of course, and SRI design reports are also um, these are design reports published uh, regularly looking at different aspects of chemical process. So once you do your literature survey, you have an understanding of, 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 your, um, of your process or of, of, of what you want to achieve, you can start sketching a base case, right? And then the part two of this process will be um, developing your detailed process synthesis or your algorithmic methods. And then finally, you take this to you iterate, of course, with your base case, make any changes that need to be changes. And then once you're happy with this step, you start looking at the plant-wide controllability, maybe having a quick look at the equipment sizing, um, capital cost estimation. So one thing you would, you would typically run into is after developing your base case, seeing that developing a PNID, seeing it makes sense, you go to your equipment sizing and you find out you need a reactor that's uh, 100 meters in diameter or something like that. So okay, it doesn't make sense now. Let's uh, maybe um, try to change the way we operate. So let's uh, change it. Uh, let's have two reactors, three reactors, whatever. And this does not necessarily change your base case, but it's more changing your detailed design because your steps will be the same. It's just the details of these steps will be different. Okay. Um, and of course, as chemical engineers, we need to be aware of many things two primary things, environmental issues and safety issues. When it comes to environmental issues, handling of toxic, toxic waste is a big one, um, especially wastewater. So 97% of hazardous waste generation by chemicals, nuclear industry is wastewater is 1988, but it's still the same nowadays. Um, and you hear on the news, all types of, uh, usually the quality of water is what motivates public uh, opinion against chemical processes, notably fracking. You know, if you have Flint, uh, what, uh, is it Flint? They have water issues over there. In New York, they have water issues over there because of fracking. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean the technology is bad. It just means that as engineers, we need to find suitable solutions around it, right? Um, and again, we usually you need to design your plan to minimize waste, especially wastewater. And if you're generating wastewater, you need to either find a 
uh, a place to dump it where you meet the regulations or treat it in a way that um, it's not harmful to the environment or it meets your local laws or you know federal laws whatever it is and get rid of it in the cheapest way possible safest way cheapest way whatever it is whatever your company culture is of course okay um the second environmental issue you have to be aware of is byproduct toxicity right so um at at the very initial stage when you have a reaction you need to take a critical look at your chemicals am i using a chemical that's extremely toxic for example hts h2s sorry some sort of cyanide whatever it is um, if it's very toxic, is there a way for me to use another reaction pathway to avoid using this toxic chemical? Um, if there is, then you need to go for it. If there isn't, then you need to find a way to use this toxic chemical at non uh, at, under non-hazardous conditions or be able to separate it um, quickly and safely. All right? Um, and uh, if, if you take your chemical engineering safety course, you'll find out that you know, the best way to do it is to avoid this reaction pathway entirely. But uh, if you can't, you need to either minimize the amount of chemicals, try to avoid them, sorry, to, try to minimize the amount of this toxic chemical you're using, or try to use it at lower or less hazardous conditions. Um, but I mean, most of the time, you'll be able to replace them by alternatives, and there are a lot of chemical manipulations which you can do. However, there are cases which you just need to deal H2S, you need to deal with cyanide, you need to deal with whatever it is, and you just have to deal with it in a logical way. All right, reduce, reducing and reusing wastes, all right? And this means recycling chemicals, right? And recycling byproducts um, and products of, of chemicals. So long time ago or previously, um, the, a lot of the time you just get rid of byproducts or, you know, um, not recycle a lot because maybe recycling requires you to have larger pieces of equipment or it makes the control a bit complex or maybe results in more downtime, whatever it is. But, you know, environmental regulations, all of this stuff are making, are pushing plants to operate in a highly optimized fashion, which involves a lot of recycle streams, a lot of mass integration, a lot of heat integration. So you don't have any type of waste, whether it's um, chemical waste or heat waste or whatever it is. Okay. So three main environmental issues, just to recap, handling toxic wastes, primarily water, reduce toxicity by looking at different reaction pathways and reaction alternatives, and recycling and reducing waste. So finding ways to you know, either get rid of this uh, waste by recycling it, so recycling it to elimination, or uh, finding uh, maybe if you have a, you're producing a lot of waste of some product, maybe you can build a small reactor and react it into something and sell it. So very common thing here is oil and gas plants. Some of them, where they have a, a lot of sulfur, they react it and they make uh, um, just elemental sulfur and they sell it to China. China buys all this elemental sulfur to make asphalt and other things. So yeah, it's a safe way instead of having to store all of this or even get rid of all of this toxic sulfur, right? Um, other environmental issues, um, avoiding non-routine events. So obviously you want to reduce the likelihood of accidents and spills. And uh, this is through the reduction of transient phenomena. So if you have, um, and by transient phenomena is, you want to run stable reactors, you want your systems to be stable at steady state. You don't want your system to be always in a transient type of state where it's extremely hard to control um, and you have high safety and operational risks. Um, yeah, so you need to rely on nominal steady state, reliable controls, fault detection systems, all of this stuff. So, I mean, if, if you're interested, if you're very math inclined and you want to, um, and you want to work in uh, process engineering, fault detection process controls is a very interesting field. And your, your entire job is trying to avoid accidents, trying to avoid non-routine events, keeping things running smoothly. All right. <clears throat> So when it comes to design objectives, your environmental goals are often not defined because uh, as chemical engineers, we start thinking from an economic perspective first, start thinking about prof profitability. Um, and then we start thinking about environmental issues as a second thought. Um, and this used to be the 
ongoing culture in many industrial companies. However, recently you'll find a lot of companies saying safety first and things like that, um, where they try to push the safety aspect or the environmental and safety aspect up, up or previously and then in the design making stage, decision making stage if you want. You know, most notably as a BP, if, if, you, if you thought, if, you, if you've been following the news the past 20 years or maybe 25 years, um, or if you look in the news, maybe you're all probably very young, um, you'll find that BP has a series of accidents, spills all over the world. You know, they're, uh, they're, they're always, their plants, they seem to be more susceptible than other companies to these environmental disasters. And when you look at it, you find out when they had a look at it, they found that, yeah, it's a company culture thing where they don't really emphasize environmental and safety aspects. And then they did all this restructuring, they changed all their management, et cetera. And now they're more safety, or they say they're more safety oriented, they're more environmentally oriented, all this stuff, right? So, I mean, this is really governed by the company culture, but as an engineer, you always have to keep it in your mind. It's always good to do that. Okay. And again, solution mixed objective function where I look at um, both economic and environmental aspects. And uh, you'll find out that government agencies such as the EPA, um, you know, Chemical Safety Board, whatever, they have a lot of environmental regulations to try and just, if, if you're not willing to look at it in your design process, then you have to follow the law and do it anyways. All right. Safety issues. So besides environmental issues, safety issues are a big thing. One of the gateway safety issues you need to consider is the flammability limits of liquids and gases. And uh, flamm flammability limits basically says that um, volume percent, of course. So if a chemical exists at a volume percent between these two ranges, then it's highly susceptible to catching fire or even exploding, right? So when designing plants, ideally you want to design your chemicals outside of these flammability limits, however, sometimes it's not possible. You know, if you're dealing with hydrogen, four to 75, very large window, acetylene, 2.5 to 100, extremely large window. So if I can't avoid or operate outside of this flammability limit, I just, I just need to um, make sure that my system is designed in a very safe way where I have um, safety backups, I have, uh, interlocked controls, all of these things. Some other times to cyclohexane 1.3 to 8%, you know, maybe you should always operate outside of this window, right? Why even take the risk? So when it comes to safety, keep, an, keep in mind your flammability limit, your thermodynamic properties of your chemicals, critical point, boiling point, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, boiling point, your thermodynamic curves, PV, your, your PVT diagram, whatever it is, you should always have an idea. You don't just start a process without knowing, without knowing anything about your chemicals, right? Dealing with hydrogen, you need to know. Hydrogen is flammable at this temperature. This is what the basic thermodynamic curve looks for hydrogen. Um, it liquefies at this pressure, all this stuff. These are the flammability limits so that you have it in the back of your head when making decisions. Um, and then of course, these limits can be extended for mixtures and for elevated temperatures and pressures. This is from thermodynamics. Um, I'm not sure if you covered this in thermodynamics, but just involves, you know, um, mixing your enthalpies, mixing your entropies, whatever it is, and you have your enthalpy of mixing, na na na, all that stuff. And it's not a linear mixing thing. Um, and of course, with this kinds of information, you need to make sure that you're trying to avoid these flammability limits as much as possible, especially in, um, transient situations such as startup and shutdown, right? Because uh, steady, let's say you're operating steady state and cyclohexane at 50%, you're outside the flammability limit, you're safe. But when you're starting up, you have uh, four hours where you're between these two. So you need to be extra careful or when you're shutting down, you have a bunch of hours where you're between these two. You have to be extra careful with your operation um, and how you're handling things. All right. And uh, you should cover this in a lot more details in your process safety course, but generally techniques to prevent fires and explosions, inner tank, so adding diluent, dilutant to reduce the fuel concentration. So um, a very common dilutant is nitrogen. So let's say um, 
but then of course this become this comes at a design cost so let's say i'm operating acetylene and i just don't want to deal with this and so i add a lot of dilute and a lot of nitrogen so that i'm always less than 2.5 percent so now my flow volume is very large so i need much larger units I probably need to separate this nitrogen out at the end so it increases my plant cost so now is it worth it to make this design decision or maybe i'll have a lot more complex controls so you need to make these decisions based on your priorities and a lot of times these priorities are governed by company culture but my recommendation to you is always think safety first design with with safety in mind because you know everyone has the right to go home after their work no one should die on the job all of the stuff which you hear all the time okay installation of grounding devices so um static um static energy is very common in chemical plants especially if you have uh, liquids with high shear they end up causing static you know static electricity in pipes and all you need sometimes is spark to blow up a uh, plant or whatever so this is something you need to keep an eye off uh, eye on um, explosion proof equipment and you'll cover this more in safety but for example if you're operating a reactor which you know will always have a chemical when it's between its uh, flammability limits maybe you'll add some explosion proof walls or whatever and ventilation sprinkler systems to sort of try and um, um, alleviate any sort of cost once something happens relief devices this is a very big field so you could just have a living or earn a living just working on relief devices relief valves it's a very interesting thing if you're interested in relief devices i highly recommend you read on it and uh you know it's a very, very big field, just designing and working in relief devices. And basically, a relief device is um, if I have a pressure operating, oh, sorry, if I have a reactor operating at a very high pressure, usually you have a device at the top, usually a valve, where if the pressure becomes too high, this valve is going to pop and release all this gas either to sort of a, another chamber or another vessel to contain it or to the atmosphere. And effectively designing this valve so it doesn't fail or designing the controls around this valve is a very big field and then of course hazard and identification and risk assessment um, i don't know if you heard about HAZOP or other things um, other sort of procedures but usually you would if you end up being a process engineer you need to have an understanding of HAZOP procedures um, osha which is the board governing these things you need to be up to date with these things and uh, just uh, knowing what to do and usually have probability data a lot of time you, you do things such as fault tree analysis and other things to understand the probability of different scenarios happening right and um, yeah you should you should look for opportunities to maybe learn something about this um, or you'll probably cover it in, in your safety course so last year we had a safety boot camp where a lot of this was covered but in case uh we will probably won't have it this year so i think it's a good idea for you to look for this information i'm going to post some videos as well as you progress through the course um and yeah learn, learn something about this all right so um steps so the design process steps in designing and retrofitting chemical plants we assess your affirmative problem process creation next week so i mean this will be now because there's no um you know it's all lumped together right okay let's move on and then environmental protection environmental regulation you need to know that environmental issues will restrict your design and all this stuff safety you always need to design for an inherently safe plant okay i cannot emphasize this enough uh don't just you know don't don't do unsafe designs or catastrophes just read read about all these chemical plant accidents you know i don't know if uh, it all takes all it takes is just some negligence or just some poor design you know you, you saw recently i don't know if you read on the news this thing which happened in lebanon where they were just there was even storing a chemical it wasn't even a chemical process but they forgot completely about safety complete lapse of judgment you know blew up half the city right um there was a recent one in texas again just uh, not taking into account the thermodynamic nature of the chemical how it uh, liquefies and when it liquefies you have enthalpy being released heat being released all of the stuff you get an explosion you always need to keep these things in mind all right so now let's move on to second part of this lecture which is process creation and um, 
So let's say, so I have my primitive problem. I have my alternatives. I did my uh, literature review. Um, I did my brainstorming. Okay, now I have an idea of which way I want to go. How do I develop a basic process, okay? How do I start, uh, how do I get to this point of having a base case? This is what we're gonna cover here. And of course, you need to, we'll talk about this and the objectives is to understand how to assemble design data and create a preliminary database. Um, implement the steps in creating flow sheets, um, which involves reaction separations and nah, nah, nah. um, and selecting the principal pieces of equipment, right? So you need to know like this is a reactor, this is a separation unit. If it's a separation unit, is it uh, is it a solution column? Is it an absorption column? Is it a filtration thing? Whatever it is, right? Okay. Preliminary database creation, assemble data and support the design. So again, once you um, first step in creating a process is you need to develop a database where you need to have a full understanding of nature of the nature of all the chemicals you're using. And again, when it comes, so in the project for this semester, I expect you to follow this where the first step is, let's say you're doing, you're working on the cheese project or whatever it is, I need you to list all the chemicals involved, you know, because it's cheese, it's not, uh, you know, it's not oil and gas or chemical. You need to know the toxicity limits for humans. Um, if there are any uh, chemicals, you need to know density, viscosity, surface tension, boiling points, all this stuff. If you're dealing with a oil and gas polymerization problem, for example, you need to know critical points, all of, all of as much information as possible. Most of this information will be thermodynamic information. Go online, go on databases, just find them. Or at the back of your thermodynamics book, you will probably find a lot of this stuff. And this will really help you assemble and support the design and make judgments or make early calls with regard to safety, with regard to environment, with regards to um, finding alternatives, etc. Sometimes if you have missing data, you need to do experiments. Um, this won't be the case for you guys doing this design, but if you work in a company, usually they have a lab, um, you know, a lot of labs, and you can ask them, hey, how about you, can, can you find out what's the, how much heat's being released when this reaction happens? Can you find out if I can make this reaction only happen in the liquid phase? And they'll be able to get this information for you. You can use it to complete your database to help you in your design process. And um, <clears throat> the preliminary process synthesis is, is usually a top-down approach. And uh, by a top-down approach means you start with your base case, which is your very high level design. And then you start going down, looking at the details, looking, enhancing this resolution of this plant, right? And uh, as you, once you have your base case and you start looking at the different options or different ways you can make this base case um, happen, you end up with a synthesis tree of design decisions or design alternatives. And um, so you can have many different options. You can use a batch mode, continuous mode. Uh, you wanna use an absorption, you wanna use a, you know, a distillation column. You have a lot of design decisions. Or you know, if you're separating four different things, should I separate A from B first? Or should I separate B from D first? All these design alternatives. And you need to start acknowledging them and find, trying to find the best route depending on your final objective. All right. And uh, your base case design should all, always focus on your pro you should, promising alternatives, right? So you don't want to have 50 different plants or 50 different base case designs to solve a problem. You want to have a base case design which can make a case for and if someone asks you why this, not that, you should be always have a reasonable answer. Okay, preliminary database creation. As we said, database should contain all your thermophysical property data, physical properties, and by this I mean density, viscosity, surface tension, boiling point, and then phase equilibrium, again, your PT diagrams, you know, your pressure, temperature diagrams, when, at what conditions is the, this chemical liquid at one condition, what conditions the gas, is it a gas, your critical points, all this stuff, property prediction methods. So um, if I'm missing any properties, what's the best thermodynamic equation I can use? Does Peng Robinson work for this chemical? Or, you know, if it's an ionic liquid, maybe I wanna use another equation of state. If it's an oil and gas, maybe I want to use SRK. You need to be able to find what's the best method I can use to extrapolate predict thermodynamic data. Okay. 
Second piece of information you need to have in your database is environmental and safety, especially toxicity data and flammability data. Toxicity data and flammability data are usually available in the MSDS of, um, of any chemical um, you're looking for. So toxicity you usually have something called L50, which is a concentration that will kill 50% of the population. Um, sometimes you have something called L90, concentration that will kill 90% of the population. Whatever it is, you need to get the toxicity data and have it in your database and keep it at the back of your head all the time. Similarly, flammability data, you need to know um, the ranges of uh, at which this chemical is flammable. As you remember from the previous table, acetylene, very high, very large flammability window, uh, cyclohexane, very small. And uh, these things, will, will you should keep them in mind when making your decision. Chemical prices as well. Um, there are many sources to find chemical prices. Um, chemical Marketing Reporter is one. Um, chemical Engineering Magazine is one. You can just use Google. But <clears throat> you don't want to use a chemical which is extremely expensive, right? So if you're looking at a reaction which needs a gold catalyst, and you want to run this reaction to generate 800 million barrels a, or pounds a year, maybe it's not a good idea, right? Maybe either find another reaction catalyzed by a different catalyst or, um, you know, bin it, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, we have, there is a large economic aspect to designing plants. And of course, experiments, as we said previously, um, if you're working for a company or a national lab, you can always run these experiments. <clears throat> the second thing you need to decide upon when uh, building your base case is your processing mode. Do you want it to be continuous or do you want it to be batch? And what does this mean? Is we'll talk about this in a second. Um, another thing you need to keep an eye on is the chemical state of raw materials and byproducts. So, is my raw material coming in as a liquid? Is it coming in as a solid? Is it coming in as a gas? So, you at this point, you can just write oh, C4H12, whatever it is. You need to know am I buying this as a liquid or am I buying this as a gas? Am I buying this maybe mixed in with some other chemical? You need to know this. And then the final product which I'm selling. Do I want to sell this as pellets? Maybe if you're making some fertilizer, do I want to sell this as a liquid stream or I'm going to put in barrels or I'm going to making some solid. Maybe it's a gas or I'm going to put in tanks. You need to understand the chemical state of both your raw materials and your products. Um, you need to have an understanding of your process operations, your flow sheeting, building blocks, right? And generally your building blocks will fall under three different um, categories, reactors, separating, separation equipment, pressure and temperature manipulation, right? Reactor, it um, seems like uh, obvious, or reactor is a unit, or uh, uh, basically it could be a packed bed, or just a, uh, it could be a huge vessel in which a chemical transformation happens. You put in chemical A, you get chemical B, or you put in A and B, you get C and D. This is a reactor. Separation equipment is where I'm separating two chemicals from each other, right? It could be either by filtration or I'm separating, uh, filtering one chemical out of the other. It could be reverse osmosis if you're dealing with water. It could be distillation where, you know, I'm manipulating the different boiling points. It could be absorption where I'm manipulating the mass transfer between the two chemicals. Whatever it is, these are all your separation equipment. Finally, pressure and temperature manipulations. So uh, compressors I have a gas coming in at a low pressure, I want to, I want it to get to a high pressure, I compress it. Expanders, gas or liquid, whatever it is coming in at a high pressure, I want to reduce its pressure. Heat exchangers where uh, I want to, uh, <clears throat> you know, change the temperature. Condensers, I want to condense the liquid. Boilers, I want to boil the liquid, whatever it is. These are pressure and temperature manipulations. So you need to be aware that, you know, these units exist and um, your base, your base case or your final process will be composed of these units, right? And then synthesis steps, and then these are, you know, once, once you have an understanding of these three major points, you need to follow these synthesis, synthesis steps. And we'll talk about them in a second. First thing is eliminate differences in molecular types. Second thing is we're gonna distribute chemicals by matching sources and sinks. Eliminate differences in composition, eliminate differences in temperature, pressure, and phase. And then we do some task integrations where 
we lump maybe steps together and do some recycles with the records. These are the basic steps. We'll talk about them um, um, later on in this lecture. Okay, so let's start off by talking about the processing mode right here. So processing mode could be continuous or batch processing. Continuous basically means that <clears throat> I always have feed coming in and I always have products leaving, right? Um, and this is what continuous operation means. Batch processing means I load my reactor with some chemical. I do some operation, maybe mixing, maybe heating, maybe cooling, whatever it is. And then after a while, I let the reaction happen, I'm cooking in a tub. And then after I'm done, I take out the products. Um, third thing, or the third processing mode is fed batch. And this means that while I'm feeding the reactor um, with my reactant, I'm either mixing, I'm heating, I'm cooling. I'm doing an operation while I'm feeding um, this chemical. And then once I'm done feeding, I stop. I let maybe let it take its residence time. And then I take out my product. And then batch product removal is I feed my reactant into one, into the vessel or into the reactor. I start an operation, whether it's mixing, heating, cooling again. And then while I'm running this operation, I'm extracting the product at the same time. Right, so um, usually these two, you might see them in polymerization. Batch processing is very com common in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Continuous is what you're gonna deal with in many of the processes, especially chemical, oil and gas processes. But whatever it is, you need to decide um, which, which one you're doing, right? And these two are also very common in food processing and other things. Okay. <clears throat> Once you've decided on your processing mode, you need to decide on your raw material specifications and your product specifications. Mass, the flow rate, very important. And deciding on the flow rate of your raw material could will depend on your um, objective of this design. Is my objective to produce a certain amount of product? If I know how much product I can make, I can go back and decide how much raw material I need. Um, composition, so what's the source of this raw material? Am I buying it from someone? Is it pure? Am I just uh, drilling and getting it from the ground? So, so what's the composition of it? Phase, is it a solid, a liquid, and a gas? Again, this is very important. Form, particle size distribution, of this is especially important for solid raw material. So if you're using, uh, if you're mining and you're getting coal or getting lithium or getting potassium, whatever it is, what's the form? Am I getting them in large lumps where I need to crush them and grind them? Um, am I getting them in, in very fine powder? Where I need to be careful that this powder doesn't block my pipes. Whatever it is, it's very important to know the form. Temperature and pressure, obviously, um, because this will guide what sort of manipulation you want, or maybe what sort of reaction reaction you want to do to avoid wasting this energy, or maybe to get them to the level on which the reaction will happen. And then other properties, like other unique properties, um, whatever it is. So if you're if it's extremely viscous, if it's uh, you know, if if it yeah, um, if if the boiling point is very low, whatever it is, you need to be aware of these things. And once the state of substance is fixed by one to six, but mostly, um, <clears throat> you should be able to know all the physical properties. So if I know my mass, of, or basically if I know my composition, my phase, my temperature, I should be able to know my density, my viscosity, my surface tension you know, color, all these uh, details, which will help you when sizing the units later on in your process, right? And if one of these jumps out at you at this stage, maybe you want to deal with it early on in your base case. So for example, if you're dealing with like uh, vacuum residue or asphalt, very viscous, very heavy, maybe you want to include it in the base case. So at this stage, you should be able to un have an understanding of your, of the nature of these chemicals. Okay, once I'm done with this uh, step, I know what my raw materials are. I know whether I want to operate in batch or continuous mode. I'm gonna uh, go through the steps. First of all, my chemical reaction, I need to know it. So once I'm happy with my chemical reaction, I need to decide on my separation of the chemicals. Then um, once I decide my, on, on the separation steps, I need to decide whether I need to do some phase separations. And then I look at my manipulations, temperature manipulations, pressure manipulations, and finally, I mix and split the streams and branches to do some recycling or whatever it is. 
So when designing a process, you always follow these steps. First thing, you drop your reactor. If you don't have a reactor, then uh, you drop your biggest, either the heart of your process. What's, what's, what is the biggest operation happening in this process? You start inside out. Um, once you drop your reactor, you what's coming in, what's coming out, etc. Start looking at separations. Do I have two byproducts I need to separate? Do I have, is, is my raw material coming in? Um, with something else mixed in, I need to separate. Um, and then I put my separation steps. And then I look at phase separation, right? Um, do I have gases and liquid coming in together? Maybe I need to do add these extra separation steps. Two and three are very similar. Um, and then once I'm happy with my reaction and separation steps on my base case, I start introducing my, um, my pressure and temperature manipulator. So heat exchangers, pumps, na na na, all the stuff, like uh, put them where I need them. Once I'm happy with this, at the very end, I can now start splitting streams and branches. So, okay, maybe I want to um, have two streams coming in for the feed. Maybe my byproducts, I'm going to split them into two. Maybe I'm going to have two reactors. Maybe I'm going to have a recycle here and all that stuff. Okay, but these are the basic steps. You put in your reactor, then you put in your separator, then you put in your temperature and pressure manipulators. Always keep this in your mind when designing your process. Okay. <clears throat> chemical reaction operations. Um, this is very is just a very general um, outline on what you should do. Um, so it will depend. So when looking at your reaction operation, you need to keep an eye on your conversion. Very important. Is my reaction happening? So if I put five moles of A, am I getting five moles of B? Even though stoichiometry might tell me this. Some other reason, you know, maybe uh, I can't mix it at this high rate or I can't get this reactor to reach this high temperature, whatever it is, maybe I'm getting a 60% conversion, 50% conversion, whatever it is. Um, do I have any side reactions? Is the reaction, is, is, are there any reactions happening in the reverse direction? All these stuff. And we'll, we're going to cover this a lot in, uh, in our kinetics course. But when designing a process, it's always good to keep, um, to keep this um, keep this in your head. And then you need to always know the temperature and pressure at which your reaction is carried out, right? You don't want to just, uh, and again, this comes back to building your database, right? I need to know the enthalpy of this reaction um, and at what temperature, what's the temperature, what's the reaction rate, um, what's the pressure, etc. cetera. Um, you should not worry about the specifics of the reactions design at this stage. So you, you shouldn't know whether you're, at this stage, you, you wouldn't have an idea. I'm going to run it as a packed bed, flow dyes bed, bubble column, slurry bubble column, uh, batch reactor, whatever it is. You really can't gauge it at this stage, but you must have an idea of technological feasibility, right? So if you're running uh, a reactor at extremely high pressures, extremely high temperatures, you need to, is, is this possible? Has it been done before? Is there a technology? Do you have an idea of the basic technology in which this might happen? Okay, maybe if, if it's not feasible or the, the numbers tell you are glaring at you, telling you, okay, this will need something extremely unique, look for something else, okay? So again, you need to know the basics of the reaction, conversion, uh, temperature, pressure, all this stuff, but you don't need to know the specific reactor design. <clears throat> okay, separation. So what's the, what does separation mean? I'm resolving differences between desired composition of a product and that's of its source, right? So if I have, uh, I'm having a product which is 50% purity, but I want to sell it at 80% purity, I need to do some separation to clean it up. Um, and separation processes are inserted at two steps, either at the beginning when raw materials contain impurities, or at the end when byproducts, products, and unreacted raw materials exist in, in the outlet. So, I can, so usually your typical process will have a separation step, a reaction step, a separation step, right? You clean up your raw materials, introduce them to the reactor, you clean up your products. And uh, of course, the choice of separation will depend on the phase in the mixture or differences in the physical properties of the chemical species. Two major types of separation, distillation, which manipulates your boiling point, and absorption stripping, which manipulates the concentration, solubility, physical properties of the chemicals. You need to keep this in mind. You're gonna cover this in mass transfer extensively, but for the time being, you need to be aware of this. <clears throat> and these are just the basic um, 
information to guide you. So for liquid mixtures, when I have different volatilities, I use solution, melting points, difference crystallization. You know, if the differences are small, then maybe I can use liquid liquid separation, use a train of different solution columns, whatever it is. For other mixtures, especially gases, I can use an absorption column, an absorption column. So absorption is when I have a gas being, the gas, so gas dissolving in the liquid. So let's say I have two gases, um, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and I want to clean the hydrogen out of the stream. So I put this gas mixture in contact with the liquid, a solvent, and this solvent will usually um, have an affinity or like, or the easiest way is can easily dissolve hydrogen. So this liquid will eat up all the hydrogen, you get up a clean carbon monoxide stream, and then you get a mixture of this hydrogen and the solvent, which can then separate and get your clean hydrogen as well, right? Absorption is when you're not using a liquid, but using a solid, like activated carbon, for example, where the molecule will stick to the surface of the solid and separating it out of the mixture. And then permeability through a membrane where you're manipulating the different sizes of the molecule. You know, hydrogen is a very small molecule, carbon dioxide, huge molecule, two oxygens, very massive molecule. So I can use a membrane to separate them. But you know, membranes usually are usually more expensive um, for for some applications, of course. Okay, so just keep an eye on these things when thinking about separation. <clears throat> Change of temperature, if you want to heat or cool a stream, you need to change in temperature. Um, of course, it's mostly achieved through heat exchanging, through a heat exchanger, um, which is the biggest temperature manipulation unit. And I expect you to know what a heat exchanger is. I expect you to know how to design a heat exchanger and to know basic things like, you know, co-current flow, counter, counter current flow, all of this stuff. Um, change of pressure, <coughs> sorry. If you want to change pressure in your operations, you use things, the manipulators are compressors, turbines, expanders, pumps, maybe valves, you know, let down valves, whatever it is. And uh, your pressure is usually, or you know, these pressure manipulations, also temperature manipulations, you don't introduce them until the very end of your base case um, design steps. And um, this line here is telling you that pressure is often ignored in the early stages because uh, many times when you do your safety assessment after or at the early stages of your detailed design, you'll take a close look at the pressures because high pressure operations govern a lot of the safety design decisions in your plant. <clears throat> and uh, however, it's common to, uh, to at least know your pressures and the reaction separation steps and, um, and be able to at least put manipulators before the reactor, before the separator in the base case, all right? And of course, when dealing with pressures, you have a lot of integration activity, especially um, with gases, you know, because, um, you know, a lot of these turbines are governed by these, you know, Carnot cycle, all these thermodynamic cycles where you can really generate a lot of energy or try to avoid losing a lot of energy by the right pressure manipulation or the right design of pressure equipment. Okay. Change of phase, um, you know, you know, if you have hot, hot effluent gases, you want them condensed, or you know, you want them, uh, you have a gas, you want it flashed, whatever it is. And this is usually done to either change your raw material into a suitable phase for your technology, or change your product to meet the specs which you want. And you change phase from gas to liquid, liquid to gas, whatever it is, either by a, um, a boiler, or condenser, all of the stuff. And then finally, mixing and splitting, combining, recycling. No, no, blending, you mix and split your streams as you need throughout your process. <clears throat> okay, so now let's have a summary of this. So you have five main synthesis steps. First of all, we said eliminate differences in molecular type, and this is achieved by your reactor. First step in your process design, you put your reactor on your flow sheet. Second step, you distribute chemicals by matching sources and sinks, and you do this by mixing and splitting. So um, and all this, what this basically means is my raw material. I'm going to use two streams, but I have two raw materials, so I have three more raw materials. My products, um, am I getting three by products, or maybe just one clean product, or maybe the product and a lot of the unreacted um, feed 
And I need to be aware that at this point, I'll have to mix, at this point, I'll have to split. And then once I decide my mixing and splitting points, I start putting my separation steps. So if I know at the end, I need to split my product from my byproduct, I put in my distillation column, I put in my absorption column, whatever it is, I put in my separation units. And then after I have my reaction and separation steps, I start introducing the temperature and pressure manipulator. So, you know, my raw material is coming in at 50 Celsius, but I want it to react at 200 Celsius. I'm going to put a heat exchanger here. My final product or the product needs the reactor at 50 bars, but I need to sell it at atmospheric conditions. So I put in an expander here, whatever it is. So you start introducing your manipulations. And then finally, um, You have your um, integration activities such as heat exchanger networks, mass exchange networks, whatever it is. We'll talk about this in details maybe um, halfway through the semester. Okay, so let's look back at our um, vinyl chloride monomer example. So in this example, you're told that satisfy a need for an additional 800 million pounds per year of vinyl chloride. We looked at the initial problem and we generated some alternatives. Um, found that you know competitors plant produces this we can purchase and ship a pipeline a company produces hcl so we found out that none of these alternatives work for us and we need to build our plant from scratch so let's do this so we're gonna look at the process synthesis or the steps and process synthesis of vinyl chloride process right again vcm vinyl chloride monomer Vinyl chloride is used to make PVC and we're gonna follow the synthesis steps one to five as we said first. Um, so step one, if you remember, we said we're gonna eliminate differences in molecular types. And before eliminating the steps in molecular types, you need to know what chemicals do we have, right? So always build your database first before even starting this uh, looking at step one. You need to have a database where you know the chemicals, you know molecular weight, at least chemical formula is very basic chemical structure, usually you would have your boiling point, at boiling point at one atmosphere, um, your critical point, nah, 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 all this information, liability limits, toxicity limits, you would have all this information at this stage. Um, so, so we know we need to do a reaction to get this more, um, to get this one more. So you look in the literature and you find out that there are, 50, there are many ways to do this synthesis, right? So you need to find the best pathway. So let's look at the different fundamental chemical pathways to get to vinyl chloride mono. First step, direct chlorination of ethylene. So you're doing your research, find out the first way to do it. I can do direct chlorination of ethylene. I get my ethylene reacted with chlora, um, chlorine, sorry. I get my vinyl chloride monomer and I get HCl. Okay. You read more, you find the advantages. You can easily purchase chlorine as a byproduct. This was, I think, alternative two. Um, and uh, it occurs spontaneously at a few hundred degrees Celsius. So you don't need to have a lot of catalysts. You're not going to deal with any catalyst issues. You just need to heat up your reactor to maybe 200 Celsius. This reaction happens quickly. These are disadvantages. The yield of vinyl chloride is low. So you get a lot of junk on the side as well, right? You get a lot of byproducts like dichloroethylene. So if I have a lot of byproducts, it means I'm gonna have a lot of separation steps, right? Maybe some might be complex, might be simple, but we're still gonna have separation to separate more than one byproduct. Um, <clears throat> half of the expensive chlorine is consumed to produce HCl byproduct, which may not be sold easily. So chlorine is relatively expensive, and if I look at it, half of the Cl2 molecule is going to make HCl, and HCl is very cheap, but no one wants to buy it. So this is its advantage, right? I'm using an expensive raw material, generating a very cheap byproduct, which I might not be able to use. Okay, so this is the first pathway. Let's look at the second pathway here. Hydrochlorination of S acetylene, right? So I have acetylene C2H2, reacted with hydrogen chloride, HCl, to get my vinyl chloride monomer. All right, advantages, as we said, HCl is cheap, it's available, people make it as a byproduct and they can't get rid of it, can buy it cheaply. Good conversion of uh, acetylene here, 
98%, but it's in the presence of a catalyst impregnated in activated carbon and 150 Celsius atmospheric pressure. So I am dealing with a catalyst now, so it's an advantage, but uh, makes things a bit more complex. Um, fairly moderate reaction conditions, so not very high temperatures, only 150 Celsius and atmospheric pressure, you know, I'm not going to very high pressures, I'm not going to very high temperatures. So this is an advantage as well. Disadvantage, remember from your table, acetylene, this guy here, flyability limit is 2.5 to 100, right? It was just waiting for a chance to catch a fire, right? So you have to be careful when dealing with this chemical. Okay, third pathway, find out that I can do thermal cracking, cracking of an intermediate. So I have two reactions. So my first reaction, I take uh, ethylene reacted with chlor chlor sorry, chlorine here, and I get, um, sorry, um, C2H4Cl2, which is dichloroethylene, right? It's, it's uh, intermediate. And then I thermally crack this intermediate to get my vinyl chloride monomer, and I get HCl, this guy here as well. And when I add these two reactions, I find out that, you know, this is the overall thing this intermediate cancels out, and I get C2H4 um, ethylene plus chlorine. I get my vinyl chloride monomer, and I get my HCl, which is my first pathway, right? But now I'm doing it in two steps. And if you remember from the, from, from the first reaction, one of the disadvantages was I get a lot of byproducts, a lot of junk. Um, so maybe this will try to eliminate this disadvantage. So if you look here, um, it's an exothermic reaction with 98% conversion, very high conversion. I'm using a very well-established technology, Friedel Crafts, catalyst, iron catalyst, again, very cheap, iron is everywhere. And then you change this intermediate to vinyl chloride by thermic, thermal cracking using an endothermic reaction, which happens spontaneously and with conversions of high 65%. So it has an advantage in that this first step occurs almost instantaneously using a very well-established technology. So we don't really need to reinvent the wheel. We can just buy the technology from someone, use their expertise to build it. And then the second step occurs spontaneously. So it will occur without a catalyst with a conversion of 65%. Okay, so this is the advantage. So it eliminates the previous thing where I have a whole bunch of byproducts, right? Uh, I still have the same disadvantage where if I look at my overall reaction here, Cl2, one of the Cls goes to HCl, right? Half of the expensive chlorine is consumed to make HCl, which is cheap and no one wants to buy, right? Okay, looking at the alternatives, okay, okay, maybe. Number four here, thermal cracking of uh, C2H4 from oxychlorination of C2H4. So now I'm trying to use a similar pathway to reaction three, but instead of using the expensive chlorine, I'm gonna use the cheap HCl. So I have my ethylene reacting into the HCl plus half, of, uh, half an oxygen, I get dichloroethylene plus water, and then dichloroethylene um, spontaneously decomposes to give me the chloride monomer and HCl. And my overall reaction looks like this. So ethylene, HCl, cheap oxygen, Cheap or expensive, uh, or can be cheap and be expensive. Depends on how you want to generate it to get vinyl chloride monomer and H2O. Advantages, highly exothermic reaction, very high conversion. So this first step also has a very high conversion, presence of a copper catalyst here. So it's a reasonably established technology. So anything with copper catalyst, iron catalyst, usually a very stable established technology. Anything with a strange catalyst, uh, you need to take a closer look. And then you followed by a decomposition pyrolysis step here. Um, it's an excellent candidate because HCl is cheap. However, because this process is very cheap, the economics depend on the cost of HCl. So at some point in the future, there is a, a worldwide surge for HCl demand and the, the price of HCl doubles or triples, this plant becomes uneconomic, right? And you know, the economic dependence of cost on a certain raw material, something you see a lot in oil and gas processes, right? Well, one of the most famous ones, Fisher Troops, for example, where the plant becomes economic when the price of oil is greater than sixty dollars a barrel. Okay, so at the moment, so now they have a bunch of plants worldwide, 
price of oil has been dancing between 20 and 40. So these plants are not economic, but uh, they, they're standing there. So, you know, this is, this is a common thing actually. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at the final one, um, balanced process for chlorination. So this is the final thing, final pathway. I have my ethylene, chlorine, I get my dichloroethylene here. And then I use my, um, I also react ethylene with HCl and oxygen to get dichloroethylene in water. And then this dichloroethylene, I decompose it, sorry, to make my monomer and HCl. And this one basically is just a combination of thermal cracking from oxychlorination and thermal cracking from direct chlorination. Right, so I combined pathways three and four to make this new pathway, pathway five. And my overall reaction here is, you know, two H2C4, Cl2, half O2, I get my monomer and H2O. And the biggest thing here is both the chlorine molecules go to make my monomer. So I'm not wasting any of this chlorine to make cheap HCl, right? Um, it's a combination of reactors three and four. All the chlorine is converted to vinyl chloride, no byproducts. And uh, does it have any disadvantages? Doesn't seem to be any major disadvantages. Probably the biggest disadvantage is you're gonna have two trains for the first step before combining them for your final step. Okay, so now I did my review. I have all my processes right here, all my pathways, sorry. And uh, which one is the best pathway to, to use? So what logic am I gonna use to get rid of these, to try and zone in on the best one for, for, for your plant? So I need to look at the alternative pathways. So due to the low selectivity, reaction path one is eliminated. So if you remember, we said the reaction pathway one, I get a lot of byproducts, a lot of junk. Selectivity of the vinyl chloride monomer is low, so I'll need to add a complex separation step. This is not an issue with any of the other pathways. So let me just get rid of it, make my life easier. Let's forget about this reaction pathway one. So I have my remaining four pathways. And in this case, I'm gonna compare them in terms of gross profit, right? Um, you might ask, maybe should I have compared them in terms of safety? Maybe, but as a chemical, because your primary objective is to meet a market demand in this case, we're looking at economics first. And then the idea here is we're gonna, after deciding, um, our process based on economics, we're going to deal with safety, try and counteract any safety problems. So especially the biggest glaring safety issue here we see is acetylene, right? Chlorine might be dangerous, but chlorine is liquefied and we can deal with it. Um, there are not many major, we're not dealing with any sulfurs, any cyanides, any, um, any of these highly toxic chemicals. We just have a bunch of safety issues, which we could possibly deal with later on in the design process, okay? But of course, if, if you try to use safety as your initial metric here and eliminate maybe pathway, I think uh, two or something, um, and then decide between the remaining three based on economics, that would also work. Um, that would also work for your base case, as long as you have a logic. And this will, this will really depend on the culture of your company, right? So different companies will probably look at safety first, might look at environmental issues first, whatever it is. Okay, so make your, uh, set your criteria, set your decisions, but always be prepared to defend this logic which you're following. Okay, so we're gonna compare the remaining four paths based on gross profit. Um, we're gonna look at the bulk prices of the feeds here, right? So ethylene, acetylene, chlorine, vinyl chloride, hydrogen chloride, water, oxygen, these are all, these are all the chemicals which we're dealing with. And this is the cost of these chemicals, right? You can see that some of them are very expensive, acetylene 50. Vinyl chloride, which is my product is 22. So probably the acetylene one wouldn't work anyways. Water and oxygen, for this case, we're assuming they're free, but you know, they're usually not free. You need to clean this water, you need to separate this oxygen. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, in order to compute the gross profit, we're doing a very, very, very generalized back of the hand calculation for the gross profit. I'm gonna write my stoichiometric reaction here, right? So I have uh, C2H4, 
plus Cl2 will give me C2H3Cl plus HCl. This is reaction pathway three. It's a one to one to one to one reaction. So I have one mole reacts with one mole, give me one mole plus one mole. The molecular weight of one mole is 28, you know, grams per mole, whatever it is, which converts to, in terms of a mass basis, I have 28 pounds of C2H4. I'm gonna generate, uh, I, I will, I'm gonna need 70 pounds of Cl2 to generate 62.5 pounds of my monomer plus 36 pounds of HCl. If I normalize this in terms of my product, so I'm dividing all of these by 62.5, so I need 0.44 pounds of um, um, ethylene, 1.1 pounds of chlorine to give me one pound of my product plus half a pound of HCl. And if I, I know my cost cents per pound, 18, 11, 22, 18. So I can generate basically an overall gross profit calculation, right? So I have my product, 20, I can sell this one pound for 22 cents. Um, here I have half a pound, one pound is 18, so 18 by, um, plus 18 by this half a pound of HCl. This is how much money I'm making, minus the costs, 18 by 0.4 plus 11 by 1.1. Uh, so the gross profit or a very generalized uh, economic metric here is, I'm gonna get 11.94 cents of profit for every pound of vinyl chloride I'm generating, okay. And if you repeat this for the rest of the processes, we'll find out that, you know, first process, you're actually losing money because acetylene is very expensive. For this process, you're not making as much money. For this process, you're not making as much money. So this is my most profitable process. So I'm going to use this as a metric to eliminate the rest. And we're going to stick with pathway three when making this decision. All right. Good. So now let's look at the... Let's look at reaction pathway three here. Um, let's recall what this pathway was. Okay, so reaction pathway three is I'm getting ethylene, reacting it with chlorine to make my intermediate, which is uh, dichloroethylene. And then dichloroethylene will decompose or basically put it in a pyrolysis unit so that I get my monomer, which is C2H3Cl plus HCl here. Um, so we're going to try to build a base case for this process. Okay, let's have a look here. Mm, okay, let's move on. So I have my chlorine, my C2H4 ethylene. I get my direct chlorination reaction, which is the first step. I have my intermediate. Goes through a pyrolysis step to get HCl. Um, my two byproducts, basically HCl, my monomer. And I have a lot of unreacted... Um, intermediate, right? Because as we said, this reaction does not have a 100% conversion, um, has about 60% conversion. So I'm going to get some uh, <clears throat> some byproduct or some unreacted intermediate here. So I, I put in my two reactors. I put in my, you know, initial steps, my mixing steps. So I need to mix Cl2 and C2H4. Then my separation steps, I need to separate HCl and C2H3Cl, which is my vinyl chloride um, product, monomer. Okay. And then we try to generate a basic mass balance, right? So we know from our motivating, um, initial motivating idea is that I need 800 million pounds per year of vinyl chloride monomer. So this translates to 300, when you have 330 days a year, um, this translates to a production rate of 100,000 pounds per hour of vinyl chloride, right? And 100,000 pounds per hour of vinyl chloride basically means 1,600 pound mole per hour of vinyl chloride. So I know my reaction is one to one to one, and I get one, you know, one uh, dichloroethylene, which is my intermediate, and then my intermediate one to one to one also breaks to my product in HCl. So if I have uh, I need 1,600 pounds per, per mole here, um, I'm going to generate 16 pound, 1,600 pounds per mole. If it's 100% conversion, I'm going to need 1,600 pounds per mole. 1,600, 1,600, oh, sorry, mole, sorry, pound moles per hour, sorry. Um, so if I know my molar flow rates, I can generate my mass flow rates, right? And this is how we got these numbers. Um, 
So 100,000 pounds per hour translates to 1,600 pound moles per hour. Um, 1,600 pound moles per hour of HCl translates to 58,300 pound moles per hour of HCl. Um, 1,600 pound moles per hour of um, chlorine is this much. And same thing for this guy right here. <clears throat> and from this principle, basically HCl sink and reagent sources can be computed. Each flow 600, 1,600 pound moles per hour. And because it's a one-to-one -one reaction, I can know my flow rate, right? So now I need to distribute the chemicals by matching the sources and the sinks. Now I'm going to look at the conversions, make sure that I have the right flow rates, um, et cetera. So I have a conversion of 100% of the C2H4 is assumed in the chlorination reaction. So in this step, I have 100% conversion. So I have 113,000. Um, 400 pounds per hour of chlorine, 44,900 pounds per hour of C2H4. They're going to react to conversion completion 100% to give me my C2H4 Cl2. And as we said before, these, this is, these translate to 1,600 pound mole per hour. So I'm going to get 1,600 pound mole per hour of my intermediate. Okay. So first step is fine. However, in the second step, only 60% of the C2H4Cl2 is converted to my final product, which is vinyl chloride. All right, so I need to deal with this somehow, right? So if, I'm, if, uh, if this goes to 100%, but this only goes to 60%, then I need to find out how much, you know, how much feed do I need to use? How much intermediate do I need? to meet this metric here, 100,000 pounds per hour, because this is the primary metric governing my flow rates, right? And uh, these, floor, these numbers are based on 100% stoichiometric conversion. But if I have a 60% here, I need to recalculate how much of this intermediate I need. And then once I know this number, I need to back calculate new numbers for these feed flow rates, okay? So let's take it from here. Um, <clears throat> So I must produce 100,000 pounds per hour of C2H3Cl and 58,300 pounds per hour of HCl, right? So I have a 60% conversion. So the additional C2H4Cl needed is computed by a mass balance to give me this. So let me just um, um, try and clarify this calculation because it might be a sticking point for, um, it might be a sticking point if you don't see it immediately. Yeah, hopefully this works. Uh, pointer options. Pen. Okay, let's see. Where's this guy here? Okay, here we go. Um, so initially we were saying that I have um, one mole of C2H or Cl2 will give me one mole of C2H. 3Cl plus HCl, right? And this is the stoichiometric ratio. However, because you have a 60% conversion, realistically, um, one mole of C2H for Cl2 will only give me 0.6 mole of C2H 3Cl, right? So, um, I need to find out how many moles of C2H4Cl2 will give me um, 1,600 moles of C2H3Cl, right? Because 1,600 translates to this metric here. So I need to find how many moles will give me 1,600. So if I do this uh, cross-calculation, so, um, so I'm going to need basically 1600 divided by 0.6 moles of C2H4Cl2. And this translates to how much here? Let's uh, do a quick calculation. 1600 divided by 
So this translates to two, six, six, sorry, six, six, six moles of intermediate, right? Moles per hour of intermediate. And if I convert this to, uh, <clears throat> if I convert this to a mass flow rate, um, let's see. So carbon is 24 plus four hydrogen plus 70. Okay, let's have a look at the let's have a look at the molecular rates here. Um, oops. So molecular rate of uh, oh we don't have it here, but C two H four Cl two so it's twenty eight plus seventy, so it's about ninety two, right? Okay, oops. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's 2666 multiplied by 24 plus 4 plus 70. And I'm going to get about, um, where is this guy here? So the number you should get will be, should be somewhere around 26. Still getting used to this. Let's see. Let's get the pen back. Uh, okay, should be two, six, three thousand, sorry, pounds per hour, right? So I need two, six, 263,000 pounds per hour of C2H4Cl, which translates to 2666 moles per hour. So basically, when it comes to the feed, I'm also going to need here. Um, I'm also going to need two six 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 uh, moles per hour of this feed, and similarly for C two H four. So these will also change, right? So um, one, once you know the conversion, you need to back calculate to get your updated numbers for the feed. That's that's the logic of them or the motivation of this calculation right here. So just keep this in mind or just, um, I mean, it's a basic logical calculation which you should have, you should have learned in your um, initial 200 course. But if you're still having, or if you're having trouble seeing this or um, understanding this, just try to revise it, try to give yourself some time to think about it, absorb it. If you're still struggling, just come to office hours. We'll talk about it in details, okay? So as we said before, so 60% conversion will also only produce 60,000 pounds per hour. So how much C2H4 is needed to, um, to determine um, <clears throat> how much C2H4, Cl2, sorry, is needed to produce 100,000. I back calculate this number, which we back calculated to be, um, sorry, which we back calculated to be 263,000. So we back calculated this number to be 263,000. And if only 60% of this 263,000 is being reacted, so the amount of, uh, so 263,000 pounds per hour is gonna give me here, um, where is, where is the thing? Okay, it's gonna give me here 100,000 of my product, which is what I want plus a bunch of excess C2H4, which is basically the difference between 100,000 and 263,000, which is, um, which is the, yeah, which is how much is gonna be left over, right? Sorry, so the difference will be basically, um, it's not going to be 100,000, it's going to be um, my initial value. So this initial value, so basically we're going to get left over about 160,000 or, or 100, 105,000. Right? So if you do this calculation, you should get this number. If 
you verify the initial intermediate. Anyways, so um, if I update my numbers based on my product metric, I'm gonna need this much intermediate. And then once I know how the, that I need this much intermediate, and I know this is 100% conversion, I can calculate these two or the updated numbers for these two. And then um, from here, I can get my updated, um, or I can get how much of unreacted raw material I have here, right? So what I'm gonna do with this unreacted raw material, I'm just going to recycle it, right? This is the whole logic here. So the additional C2H4Cl2 needs to be computed by a mass balance to equal this. And then um, this is the extra Cl C2H4Cl2 I'm gonna have left over. So I'm gonna recycle it back to get my initial, initial number, which is 263, 800, which is what we calculate, all right? So what we're doing here is after putting our calculate uh, reactors, sorry, calculating our raw materials, our basic calculations, we're adjusting our feeds or our basic flow rates for conversion issues. And once we progress more in our reaction engineering course, this will start becoming uh, more obvious and uh, yeah, more obvious to you guys. Okay. <clears throat> so now this is my updated uh, flow sheet. So effluent stream from the pyrolysis operation is a source of C2H3Cl production, um, the HCl byproduct and the C2H4Cl2 recycle. So after doing my initial pass at higher flow rates, during steady state, I'm gonna have a fixed steady state recycle of 105, 500. And this is my basic, um, basic reaction step in building my base case. So at this point, I'm done with my first step, which is putting my reactors and uh, fixing my mixing and splitting through recycling. Direct chlorination, pyrolysis, na, na, na. As you can see here, I, I, I have basic temperature and pressure data just to guide my design to, uh, for me to make decisions, et cetera. Okay, so you keep an eye on the reactor uh, pressure levels in your two reactors. Um, and you look at these from source, you look at, you determine these from sources, you know. <clears throat> so 1.5 is recommended to eliminate possibility of a leak because you're using ethylene, which is somewhat flammable. So you want to operate at a lower pressure where you can contain it better. Pyrolysis 26 is recommended by BF Goodrich. So this is a very well-established technology. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just use what has worked previously and safely for everyone else. Okay, and again, pressures will pressures and temperatures will guide your separation technology. So second step is you need to eliminate differences in composition. Product of chlorination reaction is nearly pure C2H4Cl2 and requires no purification. So you said the first step, 100% conversion, I get pure intermediate, I don't need to have any separation here. However, after the second step, it's only 60% and I get my Unreacted intermediate, I get my product, which is C2H3Cl, and I get HCl, which is junk, basically. It's cheap. Uh, I need to get, I need to purify my product from it. So because you have three, three chemicals, you want to separate them, we need to make a separation decision, right? Which one am I going to separate first? What's the best route to separate this? And then this will be a motivating example for a big part of this course, which is synthesizing separation trains and making separation decisions. So I'm just gonna show you a very basic um, overview of how we do it. First of all, you list the boiling points, right? At different pressures. Um, so in this case, in the three products I'm trying to separate here. The three products I'm trying to separate here, HCl, C2H3Cl, C2H4Cl2. I have their boiling points at the four pressures, and I know that my final reactor or my pyrolysis reactor operates at 26 atmospheres. My initial one operates at 1.5, but these three are gonna come out at 26 atmospheres. So should I separate them at 26 atmospheres or you know, if I reduce my pressure a bit, maybe I can separate them much more effectively. Should I just separate them at one atmosphere? These decisions, how to make these decisions, we're gonna cover it in the next few lectures. But for now, we just keep an eye on it. And in this case, we're gonna to decide to make the first separation at 12 atmospheres. So when I do this, you can see that immediately HCl is gonna bubble out as a gas directly. And then C2H3Cl and my C2H4Cl2 gonna remain in the liquid phase. Then I'm gonna carry a second separation step at 4.8 atmosphere at the temperature between these two, 
where I can easily get my monomer, and then um, my intermediate is going to remain in the liquid phase, and I can recycle it. And this is what we do here. So I have my first separation at 12 atmospheres. I get my HCl out. My second separation at 4.8, I get my product, and my intermediate remains to move back, to go back to the recycle point. And of course, this is a very cute example. Uh, if, if you have a case where these two the properties of these two are switched, it becomes more complex how to take this decision, uh, et cetera. Okay, so once I'm done with my separations, and now I introduce my pressure and temperature manipulations, right? So um, <clears throat> I want to enhance, increase this pressure, 26, maybe increase this temperature as I prepare it for the reactor. And then after it comes out of the reactor, maybe I want to cool it and expand it to prepare it for the separator. And then my recycle stream, I want to heat it so that I don't have a lot of heat loss, et cetera. So the final step will usually just setting your temperature and pressure manipulators. And this will be your finalized step where this will basically be your base case where you have, an under, you have a reactor here, um, direct chlorination reactor. You look at the technology, you find out that this type of reactor is used. So we're gonna stick with conventional technology. Um, for, for pyrolysis is done in a furnace. So we're gonna stick with this technology. Furnace usually has a condensing steps or quench tank. So I'm gonna also put a quench tank as established technology. Um, and then goes to uh, the two separators, gonna use distillation columns, condenser, cooling water, etc. So this becomes your base case. All right. And of course, once you get to this point, I can start looking at since history or even before this point, maybe what if what if I use any of the other pathways? I'll get I have many different design decisions to make. And basically you have infinite number of designs and you have to use your judgment to do it. And of course. You use these principles to guide your design approach, but it's also an art. Once you have confidence or once you have a sense on how to design it, have the courage, have the confidence to do it and um, defend your design and uh, be able to explain it um, in a technical way, um, et cetera. So of course there's an art aspect to it once you get more familiar and once you, you train the sense of, of how to design a plant effectively. All right, <clears throat> and uh, you know, algorithmic methods, there are computer ways to do it where they try to develop like probabilistic information and telling you to tell you what's the best way to synthesize a plant. So, you know, how, how to deal with this tree, there are very advanced numerical ways, but at the end of the day, the core, who's making a decision, it's you as an engineer. Okay. So this becomes our base case, you know, and this is the base case you're gonna take for further steps. You can always label your equipment and labeling your equipment is a good practice when doing calculations, especially when doing hand calculations. It makes it easier um, if you have multiple reactors, et cetera, just label them or the person reading can always look at your base case design, flow sheet, go back to your calculations and um, do it this way. Okay, so summary. Process creation, I expect you to create a database of all the information. If you don't have the information, you do some experiments, da, da, da. and then we do a process synthesis where I have a top-down approach, um, where I first put my reactors, decide if I need to split products or mix reactants, or maybe split something in the reactants, whatever it is, decide on my reaction step, my separation step, my temperature manipulations. Once I'm happy with all of these, I put them on paper, to get my base case design. Okay, so this is the end of the lecture. This is one of the longer lectures. I think the, this is probably the longest lecture this semester. So, um, and it gives you an overview um, on how to do the design process. And uh, again, homework one will be posted. It's due in two weeks. I'm gonna post the solutions as well. And uh, I need to know your groups. If you have any changes, tell me by. August 31st, midnight, and your group selections by September 14th, midnight as well. Okay, another video will be posted on Aspen tutorial number one. Thank you very much.